Hi, my name is Melissa Levine, and I am the current chair of the IFLA um, Advisory Committee on Copyright and Other Legal Matters. And I'm here with Victoria Owen, who is one of the editors of a volume called Navigating Copyright for Libraries. It was published in 2022 by De Gruyter, um, and it's volume 181 in the IFLA publication series. Um, the book was produced by the committee, and it provides uh, information about copyright, both at a basic level and at an advanced level. Um, it discusses uh, different approaches to copyright with comparisons from around the world. Uh, it focuses on things like reform and advocacy, and it's really meant to be a way for to help librarians navigate the copyright maze. Um, let me briefly introduce Victoria, in addition to being an, an editor of this volume, along with Susan Riley and Jessica Coates. Um, uh, Victoria contributed a chapter called With Respect to Rights in the Public Interest, um, and it's in the section on user rights in the public interest. Uh, Victoria is the Information Policy Scholar Practitioner at the University of Toronto Faculty of Information, and she's the Special Advisor to the Dean um, regarding accessibility of information at the University of Toronto Scarborough. She's currently the chair of the IFLA Committee on the Standards and has served as a past chair on, of the Copyright Committee. Um, she's currently on the Copyright Committee for the Canadian Federation of Library Associations. She is a busy person. She's a board member of the WIPO Accessible Books Consortium, or ABC. Um, and she received her LLM in intellectual property law from New York University's Osgoode Hall Law School with a master of uh, law in L an LLM. And she received her master of library science from Western University in London, Ontario, right? Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, so, uh, uh, Victoria, you're active with IFLA in so many different ways. Um, let me start with just a question like why do you why are you so committed to IFLA and why do you stay so involved? Thanks Melissa. Um, I'm committed to IFLA because it's a, a great opportunity to uh, shape information policy. It has access to experts, expertise from around the world. So we are a community of information professionals that collaborates and, and advances ac access really to information and, and you know, the whole uh, gamut of roles and responsibilities for librarians and information professionals. It's a, it's a great venue for meetings, uh, for sharing expertise, for anticipating the future and helping shape the future in terms of, for me, for, for me, information policy. It's I, I'm still relatively new to IFLA, so I like to ask this question partly because realizing that it just takes time and you just have to be in it is very reassuring, and I hope encouraging to, to other people who, who may just be starting out and trying to, to navigate. Um, so as an editor for this book, um, what, what, what was your motivation? Because it's hard enough to write a chapter. Um, it's a whole other level of commitment to be an editor? Well, the editorship, the joint editorship came after the um, uh, putting, after putting up my hand for a chapter. So it, it, the editorship seat became vacant when somebody who had been on CLM and was the proponent of this book cycled off CLM and it was left without uh, somebody who was going to take it on. So we had a meeting in at one of the uh, IFLA, con uh, IFLA congresses, and a number of us said we would we would participate in the editorship of the of the of the book to make sure that it happened. We all thought it was such an important book to bring out for to assist information professionals in this very important part of their of their professional role. So so and we wanted to reach everybody. Uh, we wanted to reach the, you know, new practitioners, but also people who've been in uh, the field for a long time and, you know, look at some advanced concepts. It's it's interesting because the book um, pub was published before I was directly involved with the committee. And I looked at it initially and said, oh, this is over 600 pages. Like, 
just very overwhelming. But when you look at the individual chapters, they both, they complement each other, but they also stand on their own really well. And um, I just, I want people to know that it's, this is worth tackling. And I find that now that I'm using it, I'm going back to it fairly frequently. The fact that it's open access entirely makes it um, something that I'm using to assign to students. Like I really try to assign materials that are either in our library or are open access. And I am really grateful for the commitment that you all made to, to making it open access. Um, now your chapter in particular covers a lot in a relatively short number of pages, really quite elegantly. Um, and you talked a, a, some considerably about um, issues uh, related to Canada in particular, and which is natural. Um, can you talk a little bit about the ways you think of Canada as being unique in this space? So my chapter is about uh, rights, it, it, you know, mostly users' rights. It really emphasis, emphasizes balance and users' rights and what is the balance against the, what is the balance in terms of the rights of the rights holder are users' rights. So that's what I'm looking at, sort of where they where they fit and and how to leverage them for the benefit of society. And and so it's it's balance and users' rights. And I think that's the uh, the the gist of the chapter is that it's a uh, it's public law, but it has it it allows for private rights, but the balance, of those private rights is for users' rights. It's for the benefit of society, for education, for preservation of knowledge, for access to, to information. So Canada is unique in, so many countries have uh, users, many countries have limitations and exceptions to copyright, but I think Canada was the first jurisdiction in, with its Supreme Court to call those exceptions users' rights. And they're not loopholes. They're 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 very much part of that copyright regime, and I think that's part of its its uniqueness. And and looking at um, certainly giving uh, credit to the the rights holders' rights for sure, and looking at them, but also understanding uh, their limitations and where those rights end and where they end. So what is not enclosed is a user right. And those those we need to keep in mind. We need to keep in mind the ones that are are given to us in the statutes, but also the ones that are not named and 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 inhabit that public policy space. That is our, you know, that's our societal role, and it's a role that governments recognize uh, worldwide. Really, that libraries are those those structures in our society that allow for that balance to happen. That's where it happens. It's it's interesting, like the two, a couple of the themes that you touch on are, are this is the include this issue of balance, and also the issue of advocacy. And in this space, I often think of advocacy as making more specific and transparent things that are somewhat assumed. Like most people just assume libraries do certain things, and then that net is that safety net of information is there, and it's not always. Um, with without more public understanding of what that how that actually works it makes it hard to have the supports in place that we need to to do the, the job that is assumed for us um anyway, i i i have to say the chapter is um is relatively short and uh is one of the tidiest um explanations of sort of the international structure that I've read, so I I do encourage people to to use to read that and to refer back to it. Um, one of the other things that we talked a little bit about was the Marrakesh Treaty, and the full title is, of course, the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise disabled. And we are about a decade in to that treaty um, entering into force in 2013. Um, oh no, 2016 it entered in force. Uh, it was adopted in 2013. Um, you have also been involved with a significant report from 
uh, the Association of Research Li Libraries and the Canadian Association of Research Libraries on, um, on the Marrakesh Treaty and its impact the decade in. Also in this space, you're involved with the WIPO Accessible Books Consortium. So I, I just wanted to, I think this is where we'll close, but I wanted to talk or hear from you a bit about um, whether you, whether and how you think the treaty is making a difference, um, anything you might want to discuss about the ABC, which is a really interesting um, initiative. Oh, and you are a board member, of course, of that. So thanks, Melissa. In the in the book chapter, we talk about the Marrakesh Treaty, and it is the and I think it's really worth noting that it is the first users' rights treaty in the history of WIPO, and uh, it also interestingly, it's the fastest moving treaty that WIPO has ever produced. So it had it had a lot of signatories, and a lot of countries have implemented that treaty. Um, so it is a users' right. It is about uh, people who have a print disability being able to make to have access to works without without the permission of the of the rights holder. So it's to make information accessible to people with print disabilities. So it's um it's the it's the foundational policy piece that was needed. And many national legislatures had exceptions to make accessible work uh, works. But they did. There was no international component for sharing those files or those books, and the Marrakesh Treaty allowed for that. Sort of the creation of one, of a, of one, one title in the whole world that could be shared in the whole world instead of every national institution, any every institution in each country making the same work over and over again. The most popular works were made many, many times, which uh, does not. Uh, it isn't a good use of of all those resources, the so limited resources that are are, are used for accessibility. So that um, was the the other cornerstone of it is the that um, cross border uh, provision in the in the in the in the treaty and in in the statutes that have implemented it. <clears throat> so as you say, we are well into the implementation phase, but as I observed it was hard to see progress in libraries on the implementation. What was the difference that people with print disabilities were feeling at the, you know, at the library level in terms of education or how, whatever library they were using? Um, and it was, it was still limited. So the, the ARL and Carl uh, implemented the, that task force was looking at what were what what are the barriers? Why aren't we implementing it better? And the brilliant part of having ARL and Carl involved in this is, you know, research uh, libraries in North America have some of have some wonderful bench strength in terms of metadata and systems. They have some, you know, we have those institutions have leaders, experts. In, in these fields. So it was like taking the cream of the crop and having them look at this and 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 figure out what the problems were and where where the issues were. So we came up with, you know, the metadata. We don't have standards on metadata for accessibility. So we do need those standards. We need international standards so that all of our description of those resources use the same fields and are discoverable. In, in the metadata. Uh, we didn't, we don't have that yet. So um, as you mentioned, I'm also the chair of the advisory committee on the uh, advisory committee on standards for IFLA. So that's one of the things that we're looking at is advancing those metadata standards uh, at IFLA at the international level. So and that loops in with a lot of other uh, countries that have those experts working on them and other also other uh, organizations that are interested in the same accessibility metadata. So rights holders are, uh, the World Wide Web Consortium is, so just working in that milieu with all of them so that we can advance that description so that we can find things and and then share them, have crosswalks so that we can all share that that access to it. So that's that's uh, uh, one of the things that it it uncovered, as well as 
you know, a bias in our systems. We we don't often <laughs> recognize that in ourselves, but you know, our library systems. Um, when we we buy them, when these institutions buy them, we all have legislation that says that things have to be accessible. Um, so we we when we do the when we buy these library management systems, they say they're accessible. But when you look deeper, that's one of the things that we discovered is that those the metadata fields, even if they were populated, they're they, they're turned off so that so that a search wouldn't yield results for accessible works. So that those kinds of things need to be addressed. So there's metadata, there's systems, and then there are policies at the institutions that are still um, discriminatory against people with disabilities that we need to look at. So, so that's what the ARL uh, Carl uh, task force uncovered and both ARL and Carl are um, now looking at how they're going to address the recommendations that came out in that task force. I, so with, oh, sorry. Briefly on the, yeah. on the, the, that report from ARL Carl, one of the things that I thought was striking was how uh, explicit it is that it is less expensive for libraries to acquire an accessible copy if it is made available by a publisher, by a vendor, and that this is a place where libraries are having to fill a gap in the market. It's it's not it, th these things kind of dance with each other. I thought th I thought the report was very good about the explicitness. And I also, I don't remember if they talked about the sustainable development goals, but to me, this all flows right into the sustainable development goals is another conversation. Yeah, the accessible publishing piece is a really important piece. And we we are uh, very interested in, in seeing that develop in the marketplace. Um, that would be that would be a wonderful outcome, and you know it's happening bit by bit. Ebooks in in the EU, their legislation is they have to be accessible by twenty twenty five. So so we're so some jurisdictions are moving ahead. Progress. Um, yeah. So uh, oh, did I cut you off? No, I was just going to say a little bit about the the uh, world blind the world intellectual properties accessible Please. book consortium ABC. So that is that uh, is coming up to its tenth anniversary too in in April, um, and it was a joint uh, effort by stakeholders at WIPO to implement to begin to implement the Marrakesh Treaty, and that is what they're doing. They are uh, a repository, really, uh, of of accessible work. So many countries, many countries who have. Uh, implemented Marrakesh, the institutions in their countries are able to deposit or make accessible uh, the files that they have, the uh, e-files, braille files, many kinds of, of works, and make those available. So the work of the Accessible Book Consortium, ABC, is, is to manage that repository and the description of the work. So they, too, are very interested in IFLA's work on uh, on standard metadata for accessibility, standardized metadata for accessibility. So, um, so it's a it, it is one of the bright lights in terms of the Marrakesh Treaty that it has, because it's sort of transnational, and there was there wasn't space at, in all these uh, national uh, libraries to take on this role. So it really is something that facilitated. Uh, Marrakesh, and so it, it's it's a brilliant uh, office, and it's it's got a brilliant head too. It's a really elegant um, facilitation towards solutions that are real, not just words. Um, uh, th this has been fantastic, and um, I just want to come back to telling people they should look at the book. Um, is there anything else you want to add before we stop? Well, thanks, Melissa. I, I think the book has such a broad appeal because if you're just beginning, you only need to look at the early chapters. And as your knowledge grows, you can delve into the more complicated ones. 
but it is uh it's something there we that's what we designed it as something for everyone so that you could dip your toes in or you could really um engage with some more challenging uh copyright matters so and it's available and accessible to uh because it's open access. And that was something that was really important to for the editors. That was, we weren't going to do it if we didn't get uh, open access. I will say it is available for sale in print if you do want a hard copy. Um, but uh, I, I think it's really compelling. And I'm, I, I'm pleased to have these conversations to encourage people to look at it and to get you to know you all as the, the creators. So, all right, I'm gonna end there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Melissa. Bye. See you again.